much for coming out uh, tonight, everyone. Uh, Thank you for the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Weekend coming. Let me take off my jacket. We're just a bit curious, for starters, if many or most of you have seen one or some of Joe's films in the series so far. Could we just have a kind of show of hands if most of you have seen one or more of the films? Okay, great, great. For those of you who haven't or who've only seen one, we'll be talking generally about Thai cinema, what's going on in Thai film today, and what uh, the place of Joe's films is in contemporary Thai cinema, and also a little bit about historically what Thai cinema has been and why Thai cinema is such a new thing to most of the world, um, and why Thai cinema even in Thailand seems so new at the moment. Um, Maybe, though, we should start because Thailand, while Thai food is very well known, particularly in the U.S., Thailand itself and many aspects of Thai culture are not particularly known worldwide. Um, about four years ago, as I was getting ready to move to Bangkok, I went to dinner with some friends, and uh, I happened to mention that uh, my wife was Thai, and one of the people at dinner said, whoa, does she live in Taiwan? <laughs> so oh, I have the same experience yes. <laughs> here. So it might be helpful to start out saying a little bit about, just for starters, where Thailand is, and also something on the order of what Thailand is, what Thailand, how, where is Thailand geographically, and, and what is Thailand historically, and what is, what is Thailand today? Come on. <laughs> Well, it's one of the Southeast Asian countries, and we um, we are surrounded by um, a lot of uh, neighbors: uh, Laos, uh, China, Cambodia, and Malaysia in the south. So basically, we we in the middle, and um, we never um, we never been colonized. So actually, Thai means free, so it's, uh, it's freedom. But um, that, that we have a long, very long history of, uh, of the monarchy uh, system. And uh, so actually uh, the filmmaking uh, came from the, the, this system because of the monarchy, uh, the, the king you know, had the opportunity to, to uh, come to the West and brought back uh, science, uh, knowledge, and uh, so most of the first film were made in the palace. That um, the palace also is the place where where the traditional uh, play um, is going on. What's going on? So it, it seemed logical, you know, that they made film there, you know, to replace the play, and it become like a novelty, like a, like a trick, or, um, kind of uh, a casual home movie. And, and then uh, it progressed uh, until now that uh, we've been kind of sync, sync up with the, the rest of the world. Mm. And, and now uh, I think Thai film is, is kind of um, like other film in, in Asia, that kind of dominated by American uh, films also. Mm. Yeah. The one, just to go back to where Thailand is, <laughs> one significant absence to what you said, though, in, in mm. terms of Thailand is very much in the heart of Southeast Asia. It, Bangkok is, in a way, the heart of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But the one neighboring country that you didn't mention is Burma, oh, forgot, yeah. which has been historically pretty much the only <coughs> enemy Sorry. that Thailand has ever had. And, con and to this day, there continues to be a great deal of tension between Thailand and Burma. And this is something that comes up in, in a number of Thai films and also particularly in, in one of Joe's films, which we'll talk about and we'll see a clip from tonight, the film Blissfully Yours. Um, it's very true what Joe is saying that historically and originally at the end of uh, uh, the 19th century that the Thai royal family were the first people in Thailand to bring in movie equipment, movie cameras, uh, film, and the, the history of Thailand sort of starts with royal home movies. The royal family photographing themselves, photographing official activities, but photographing just everything that would happen in court life. And that tradition continues today. One of the most famous contemporary Thai filmmakers is actually um, a member of the Thai royal family, uh, Prince Chatri, uh, who's sometimes known as Tan Mui. 
Uh, his most recent film is a film called Suriotai, which played in the U.S. Um, and this is a film that was financed by the Thai royal family. Um, and the, the history, historically Thai film is, is, is very problematic because historically movies in Thailand were not regarded as a very important part of Thai popular culture. They were regarded as completely disposable. They like like popcorn itself. You kind of consume Thai movies and then you know there was nothing left. You threw the container away. Thai movies historically there were only one or two prints made of a Thai film and they were shown all around the country until the prints fell apart and then whatever was left of them they were tossed in a ditch. There was never any effort to preserve Thai film history or Thai film culture traditionally. The, the film, I remember this, the film was um, used as a measurement tool in the village. Yeah. Uh, the old film. So that's like measuring tape. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's one of the. Yeah. So well, then your films would have measured very long distances. Well, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, today there is a, a very different attitude in Thailand toward film history, and, and there's a, a great deal of concern about not only Thai films that are being made today, but trying to recover and preserve as much of Thai film history as still exists. Uh, there is a Thai film archive that's received some financing from uh, the Thai government, from the royal family. In fact, the Thai film archive was originally started by the royal family as a place to deposit all these royal home movies that had been made since the turn of the last century. Um, it's only as a kind of byproduct that there was space left over in the storage areas that the director of the Thai Film Archive, Dom Sukfong, uh, decided to start collecting narrative cinema from Thailand, popular movies. Um, since about 1950, there have been many, many Thai films made every year. Uh, the high point, I guess, was in the 1960s when there were more than 200 Thai films being made every year. That's kind of a deceptive figure because most of those films were shot in 16 millimeter. They were shot silent. Uh, they were made in three days. Typically, popular movie stars would make 30 or 40 films a year, and they would just kind of race from one film set to another. They would sleep in their cars. Often they didn't know which film they were shooting on which day. Um, and many of those films are lost today. They are, by and large, very crude by international standards. I mean, if you think of the 1960s in American filmmaking or Italian filmmaking, French filmmaking, Japanese filmmaking, the 1960s are regarded as a kind of golden age when filmmaking had reached this kind of peak of sophistication. The Thai films were, in the 1960s, enjoyable and charming, funny, I mean, action films, romances, comedies, but they were, by international standards, so incredibly crude. It's, it's really difficult to imagine. I mean, they look like they were made in the, I don't know, the 20s or 30s rather than the 1960s. Um, Joe, what year were you born? 70, 1970. When you yeah. were growing up as a very young kid, did you have much exposure to Thai films of the 70s or even earlier films? Were, were older Thai films shown on television when you were growing up? Not really. It, it was more like cinema experience that my parents took me to, and uh, I saw a number of Thai films. But, but that at that time, yeah, I think, yeah. And the time, it, it was quite. When you look at it, it was very related to Hollywood style as well, because remember, there's a movie called uh, Ngun 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 Money. Sure. And, and it's kind of musical, and and that's a boom of the Hollywood musical also. And during my time, I think it's a disaster film, like a towering inferno, you know, earthquake. So, so I saw a lot of tempo, like broken down, and uh -huh. stuff like that. Yeah, and, and so I was very fascinated by, by those kind of film. And yeah, so and and during my time, there's one Thai animation also, only one until now, yeah. the feature length animation. So, 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 so um, so um, I think I, I, I was born in a period of transformation from the old style to the new. Um, old style, I mean, we still dub the voice of all the actors, and um, and with this uh, sheep style that you mentioned about uh, making very quickly, yeah, and a very stu studio system like uh, Hollywood in the past, you know. But um, 
when I was a teenager, it started to ship with uh, one studio called Thai Entertainment. You now they start to have uh, this sophistication enough to have a you know, sing sound system in 35 millimeter. So and the, the film subject changed to uh, more of, uh, closer to us, more like uh, daily life of teenagers. And but that's the 1980s you're talking about. Right? Yes, yes. So, so I was in the period of, of changing, of this change. Yeah. I think that's an important thing to emphasize that that up until the mid 1970s in Thailand, all films were shot silent, and there was a tradition of having very familiar people narrate the films live and produce sound effects and produce music live to accompany the films. This is something that was happening in Japan in 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 the 20s and 30s, as late as the, the 1940s in Japan. But we're talking about, you know, almost to the point of, say, you know, Taxi Driver in the U.S. is 1976. Uh, up until that point in Thailand, films are still being made silent, and all the voices, all the sound effects are being done live in theaters by live performers. Um, kind of charming. But <laughs> it's it's charming, but it's, it's kind back. of... It's it's like a throwback. It's it's, yeah, it's yeah. the 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 very ancient or or very remote things from the past persist into Thai film culture until very very recently. Right. In the seventies, a lot of things changed in Thai filmmaking. Thai films became, well, Thailand changed quite a bit in the nineteen seventies. There were democracy movements and yes. uh, kind of new political ideas. At the same time, there was a lot of violent repression by the military trying to suppress ideas about democracy and new freedoms. And, and for the first time, Thai movies actually started to address ideas about contemporary Thai life. Uh, the filmmaker I mentioned before, Tan Mui, who made Suryo Thai, which is a, today a big historical epic, because he was a member of the royal family in the 1970s, he had the liberty to be outspoken and address issues like prostitution, juvenile delinquent crime, um, uh, he, he, he tackle issues like um, poor people that it's not not a popular issue of Thai film time because it's it's more like an escape you know when you go to the movie you know uh, like a fantasy or something spectacular yeah so he introduced this issue as, as well social and class in in Thai culture yeah. so the idea of modernism in Thai film is not about art films or making films that are so experimental or difficult to understand. It's really about making films that actually bear some relationship to daily life. And this is what's going on in the 70s when, 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 when you're a kid, yeah? Right, right. Um, you were born in Bangkok. Yeah, I was but born you in Bangkok, but uh, my parents, they, they were doctors and they were quite adventurous, so they moved to Konkan, which uh, about five hours drive from Bangkok. and. It was the land of nothing, you know. It's very, it's the poorest region um, in in the country, and uh, so my parents moved there and to practice, you know, to to start this small hospital. And uh, so I I grew up uh, about 15 years. In my first, uh, you know, first 15 years, I spent all my life in in the hospital area that they have the housing for doctors. So um, so I, I'm kind of attached to that <laughs> environment also and also Con can become a university town also um, part of the government to decentralize and to educate you know um, people so um, all of my experiences were in that town that small town that um, from until 1994 that um, then I moved to study in the US yeah. even though Con can is a is a kind of big city for that part of the country, yeah. all the immediate area surrounding that, and this is the part of Thailand that's usually referred to as Isan, uh, the part that, that borders the country of Laos. Um, it's, it's largely rural. Uh, people largely live in more or less impoverished circumstances comparatively. Um, people with whose education typically stops when they're about 12 years old and, and they work uh, in agricultural areas. Um, but it's, it's, it's now it's expanding and growing very fast. Well, Konkan is a very big city today and a very yeah. big university there. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if five years we have Starbucks and 
Yeah, <laughs> probably so. It's quite. Yeah. You uh, went to school in Konkan for university as an undergraduate. Yeah, undergraduate. Also. And you studied yeah. architecture. Studied architecture, right? yeah. Uh, because I, I also have interest in architecture. Um, that that um, because I, I uh, in Thailand you have to choose between liberal and science. You know, so I choose science and. And then it became a trap because I, I didn't know, you know, many people didn't know, and and that actually I like liberal arts, but but when I I choose sign, you know, I sh the choice I had was uh, one of them was architecture that I I deemed that it it combined, you know, art and science, so I I choose that, and and at the time I would like to make films, and but but there's not good film school in Thailand that. Yeah, so I, uh, since I study, I like architecture, so I just, you know, did that for five years, yeah. But you already had some sense that really what you wanted to be doing was making film, or at yes, what, when did yes. you really realize that that's what you wanted to do? In the, um, when I was um, 12 or 13 or something, the, but but movies always being my escape, you know, um, because Konken and hospital area uh, was nothing, you know, it's not in, was not interesting uh, to me back then. So uh, movie house is where I <laughs> spent my time, and and so we got to see a lot of um, um, say Thai films and American films, and I remember w I went to see The Deer Hunter. And um, twice, and and my mother hit me because why? Why did you go see it twice? It's already it's you've seen it once. Why see it? Yeah, again? yeah. It's, it's not enough for me. Yeah. So, but I was very young. But anyway, the I think that the the film that really hooked me was um, Steven Spielberg. Um, he made at time Raiders of the Lost Ark and um, E. T. Mm -hmm. It was super film for me. It was uh, I was. It was in incredible, and uh, when I look back now, it was. It feel like it makes sense because it's a booming of film. Also, I think American film during the time was not so healthy. Also, when E.T. came up, it suddenly become the huge hit and renaissance. Um, so in Thailand, also it, this impact, you know, resonates in, in even in that small town, and uh, so. And talking about Spielberg, it, the way he used the camera and the sound, it's so uh, so easy to to get into it, you know, to to understand by kids, you know, to um, because it's very emotional. So that's that's why I think, wow, this is super uh, world that is different from the hospital. So um, you know, so I decided back then, my, I I want to be part of this world, but anyway, I didn't know how. <laughs> And and the school back then, you know, when we talk about filmmaking, we we didn't have a, a, a real film school, yeah. So we don't really um, consider that filmmaker is a career. Filmmaking is a career. So um, yeah. so one of the reason that that is an I study architecture also to be like a backup career. Yeah. You think you'll still have to. Fall back on it at some point. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Raiders of the Lost Ark because, in a way, that's you know that's a very old-fashioned style of filmmaking for Hollywood too. That's a, but in a very souped-up and very modern way. You know, a kind of high-budget uh, remake of films of serial films from the 1930s. Yes, and Spielberg was very really good at that. The way he used the camera and the tracking to to the back of the head or something to build emotion, that's, that's like classical. Yeah. But that's also a lot like what Thai films in the 60s were like, the kind of action-adventure, very quaint, very charming, you know, old-fashioned action-adventure films. But Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of pumps a lot of money into it and special effects and makes it something new, something very old turned into something very new. Yeah, the, the way he used, you know, camera and the sound is an, as a language, you know, it's very, very apparent, very obvious. In Spielberg's, you know, but for Thai film, it's not that obvious. It's just uh, just telling story, you know. But but not through you're not so conscious about style as as that. So so that's why I think I'm really hooked up to that. And also many horror films, you know, in that period. 
Yeah, American. So after you studied architecture in Konkan, how did you end up going to Chicago and studying at the Art Institute? Um, I, I remember one class, it was like psychology class in, 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 in architectural school. You, it's like a big uh, hall auditorium and the teacher has uh, um, one of the, um, the students came up one by one and, and tell the class what, what you see yourself in the future, what, what you want to be. And they said, I want to be a filmmaker. And everyone was <laughs> silent. And, and, the, <laughs> and the, 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 the teacher, he's a, she's a psychologist, but she, she came to the podium and said, look, Apisha Pong, um, you know, sometimes you have to realize that real life is not you know, like as you dream and you have to set goals. You know. So I was so mad at this teacher. I was, damn. This <laughs> so I, so it, it's like a push also, you know. Like when you try to learn Thai, as I said, give up, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really a push, a push for me to 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 try to make, you know, to prove her wrong, and and anyway. So I, I, after that, I, I I try to see what what my options are, and and then so I I saw this brochure from the School of the Art Institute. I was very impressed by the brochure, so it's very important, <laughs> and. <laughs> So and and this is uh, the one with the latest deadline, and I didn't know anything uh, much. That I I, I I assumed that American film school, you know, were the same, but I was lucky to to got into that school that uh, it it was just the right kind of film that I I was looking for. But I didn't know that um, you know I want to express something, but I didn't know how. You know, I remember I got the first video camera um, in in th in Thailand. And the first shot I, sho I shot was a fire, you know, I burned, uh, I burned uh, paper. And I didn't know what it meant, but it's just so satisfying to shoot that with our story, you know, it continue until now, but, <laughs> you know, but, but, but that, that kind of fascination with image, with movement. And, and so in Chicago, it was the first time I saw experimental film. And then, wow, it just clicked that, wow, this is, this is like that fire, and this is what I, I, I was comfortable with and I, I, I want to do. So uh, then I, I just immersed myself in, in a lot of experimental films. Yeah. It's interesting that you would end up at Chicago at the School for the Art Institute because it's really not like many film schools in the U.S. because there's a very much a, an emphasis on on the fine arts as a kind of uh, adjunct to filmmaking. There's an emphasis on experimental filmmaking and unusual non-commercial types of filmmaking. Mm. But you're coming from this background where Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. Are, are the things that really motivated you to start with. Before you went to Chicago, had you had any exposure to experimental filmmaking? or Not, not in the sense of real experimental, but, but I, I have seen quite a number of European films through video. Yeah. But uh, I didn't see I didn't see that extreme, you know, like experimental film. Yeah. How did, given all the experience you'd had up until the point you went to Chicago, after going to school there, how did that? How do you think that changed you or changed your attitude toward what you wanted to do as a filmmaker or what you wanted to do with your life? Um, I I want to do experimental film uh, in the beginning, and I want to do only black and white in 16 <laughs> and and but when I because it's very very um, the medium is very intimate you know 16 millimeter or super 8 and you touch it you you know it's not like 35 and um, then when I went back to Thailand I realized I tried to make experimental film um, but it didn't fit it didn't fit in the culture I, I, I couldn't explain that um, so I, I try not to push, and I try to ignore the the, the definition. This is experimental or not, you know. So I just um, you know try to shoot something that that can express what I I like about Thailand, what I uh, relate to, you know, landscape, people, and yeah. So I, I didn't think that it would be this or that kind of film. 
Yeah, so it, it kind of evolved from from that. That, but but it's quite realization that structural film, materialist film is is not is not for Thailand. Mm. I, for I guess. Me, I guess we should say that as ephemeral as the history of Thai film, even very popular Thai films, uh, as difficult as it, as, as it is to see old Thai films and, and, and given how few old Thai films were preserved, um, I mean, there's almost no history of experimental or art filmmaking in Thailand prior to, well, prior to now, really. I mean, there are few filmmakers who were making sort of unusual films in the, in the 80s. Uh, but but before that, there's no. I mean, experimental filmmaking in the rest of the world, in Europe, particularly, mm -hmm. since the 19 you know 10s and 20s in Russia and Europe, and then uh, in America since uh, the 40s, there's been a you know a kind of alternative cinema or an other cinema going on. But Thailand doesn't really have any sort of history like this. Not really. So when when I came back, um, I was thinking because um, people say that. You know, it's Western style, it's Western influence. You know, but but for me, I have a um, a lot of international friends who study in Chicago, and um, we talked about this, and we say, well, if if your teacher give you a camera and and go out to shoot Chicago, you know, each one of us we will we sh will come back with different material according to our experience, so our roots. So um, so I think it. That that's kind of uh, it's not an issue, you know, because I, I came from Thailand and I have a lot of experience in my 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 um, point of view, you know. So I will view Chicago differently. So when when I went back to Thailand, you know, so so that's why I'm really against that that I brought this <laughs> kind of Western practice to Thailand. That's, and then you know, so I found uh, the experimental film festival. To br to bring a lot of film uh, experimental film from from many parts of the world to share with people, and also to to see look that this thing is going on, and then um, you know um, just just to to sh to share with Thai people that um, you know the the different kind of cinema out there, and um, you know don't be afraid to ex express you know. And interestingly, after the film festival, uh, it started in 1997. And it's um, which film festival is this? Bangkok Experimental Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And you were instrumental in in getting that started. Yes, yes, yeah. So it was uh, kind of afterwards, uh, people then you can see a lot more student kind of play with with their camera, with with the, which didn't happen before. Mm. You know, maybe they kind of simulate this what they saw. In the festival, but but anyway, I think it's very healthy because now now it's become more of a in tune of the they are not afraid of of doing different kind of narrative, you know. And and now, as you know, the Thai short film is quite healthy in a way. Yeah. I want to get to a, a clip from your first feature film, Mysterious Object at Noon. But before we show that, I want to just say one more thing about your personal history and the way it seems to me it is a part of Mysterious Object at Noon, and that's this idea of migration. Um, typically in Thai life, many people from the area around Khan Ken, the Isan area of Thailand, migrate to Bangkok in search of work. Yes. Many of the service industry people who work in Bangkok, taxi drivers, construction workers, people who work in restaurants and bars, typically come from the Isan area. It's, it's, it's unusual and interesting to me that you kind of had reverse migration, that you were born in Bangkok, and that you migrate then to the Isan area, yes. and then from there you migrate internationally. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a kind of reverse yeah. phenomenon. And it, I think it's good for me because I, I see the, the system and uh, somehow it was uh, upsetting, but somehow it's you know, uh, helping me appreciate you know, and see the whole picture because as a person from Isan, you know, um, Bangkok people always look down on people uh, from from the poverty. You know, Isan people is the worst. You know, is unsophisticated and crude, and you know. Um, so I have that this kind of um, inferior uh, feeling complex that that you know Bangkok people always got more education, more um, access to many resources. Yeah. 
But anyway, um, then I came to Chicago, I skipped Bangkok. And then um, people, you know, think of Thai people also, you know, you cannot deny that it's a kind of, somehow it's racist in, 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 in some, uh, some event, you know, in, in life. And I got, at one point, there's, I was on the bus and then there's this guy told me, you go back you, to your country, you know, so something like that. When you were in Chicago, this yeah, time. yeah, oh. 1994, mm. and uh, recently also in in I, when I was before I come here, you know, there's uh, one lady say, you know, the same thing, you know, go back to your country. Really? Yeah, it's kind of, you know, so so I I just figure well, it's just um, you know, level of level of kind of people have this preconception of other culture you know, because they don't have education and, you know. So um, when people look down on Thai people, you know, they don't care if you're from Bangkok or you're from Isan, you know. So, so I say, well, that's life, you know. I have to say that it doesn't just happen here. I had an experience in Japan many years ago and I, uh, I looked very different. I had very long hair and looked much more like some kind of biker dirtbag mm. and uh, was walking around in Japan one night when a guy came up to me and said, G.I. Joe, go home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this happens everywhere to everyone, I think. Yeah. It's interesting to talk about migration because in Mysterious Object at Noon, which is um, uh, your first feature film, yes. even though you'd made many short films and, and videos before that, several anyway, mm. um, it's a film about many, many things, even though you sometimes like to tell people it's about nothing at all. It's actually a very complicated film. One of the things it's about is is migration and traveling around Thailand and trying to collect a variety of ideas and experiences and, and people in different walks of life from all over the country and see how they relate. Um, what can you, maybe you can say better than I, uh, what, what mysterious object at noon, what, what is it about? <laughs> well, you said I, I told you it's about nothing. Okay, it's about nothing. But, <laughs> but well, for one thing, it's both a documentary film and a fiction film. Yeah, just tell the minute because, like, uh, mysterious object at noon is about eighty-three minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's about <laughs> yeah, eighty-three like minutes. Long. And basically, yours is about two hours. <laughs> I think but we're uh, about <laughs> done. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's more of my. I was kind of confused also, and, and also I, I, I want to make this thing in Thailand and try to integrate of Thai culture in, in the film. And, but somehow I, I didn't know, so I just get the camera and uh, 10 people volunteer and without pay. So back then people were very quite interested in, in this, you know, so I put an ad in a newspaper and, and people response so we start to travel since the project doesn't have much you know budget so we this kind of structure is very flexible you know we should sit this city and if we run out of money we just stop and then because the film is not it's kind of continuous in a way but but uh, the, the structure of shooting it is not depend on continuous time you know it depends on the place the villages so um, uh, I think maybe you all have seen the film, or maybe not. Should I? Yeah, it, it's about that. Um, um, I ask people to continue a story, a fiction story, and then I go to another uh, village and then ask another person to to continue that story. Um, so the, the in the end, I travel from the north to the south of Thailand, collect all these fiction stories by many people. So, um, so the tales become kind of mutated from from different perspective, and and then uh, when I uh, finished at the south, I came back to Bangkok, and we shot a kind of fiction film out of that, and intercut with the with the documentary with the lives of the the storyteller to contribute in the film, the story. So it's both kind of a documentary about ordinary people in average professions of various sorts throughout the country, people who sell fruit and vegetables and fish sauce from the back of a truck, people who are policemen or people who are elephant trainers, people who are kickboxers, um, 
you get a little sense of, of each of these people's everyday lives, but then you also ask them to contribute a little part to a story that's kind of evolving as you make this film. Yeah. So the story starts with one small idea, and then the next person you meet adds an idea to that first story part. So you're documenting the telling of the story, which is a kind of collective telling, many people adding to the story bit by bit. Yes. And then you go back to Bangkok and you shoot fictional or dramatic performances of parts of this story, and then cut all this together in this kind of blend of documentary and fiction, right. storytelling and dramatization. It's a, I think it's the third film of mine that, that I'm dealing with this kind of the line between fiction and non-fiction because I, I don't think it exists, I, I don't think um, non-fiction exists because movie making is subjective. You know, the first time you shoot is, is already you, your point of view, you know, where you place the camera or when you cut it, you know, when you, when you cut the film it becomes your decision. So I don't believe in documentary in, in that sense, in the presenting reality because it's all illusion. So, so I, I like to tackle with this issue of, of the line between this and how sometimes you cannot tell if it's true or not. Yeah. Well, what, what, let's go ahead and show the clip, but let's just say that the story that's being told yeah. is a story, it starts out as a story about a woman who's a teacher who's kind of home teaching a boy who is uh, restricted to a wheelchair in his home. Mm -hmm. And what is she teaching him? She's sort of giving him an idea of what the outside world might be like. Is that, is that basically how the story starts? Right, right. So the clip we're going to take a look at is about 10 minutes or so into the film. And this is a very rich and very complicated film. It's almost like a, a, a modernist novel. It's almost like Finnegan's Wake or something. You can look at this film many, many times and see new meanings each time, realize different ways that different parts of the film connect to one another. I think I've seen the film 15 or 20 times, and I'm always seeing new things in it. It's, and one of the great things about this film, is, it, as far as your films, which are somewhat difficult to see, especially in the U.S., is that this film is available on DVD in the U.S. And it's a film that really repays uh, repeated viewing, I think. Um, the, 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 the few minutes we're going to look at here, um, do, do you want to say something about where we are? The film has already begun, and, and the story is in progress a little bit. I think it's the one that we're moving to the north, right, with the wom old, old woman. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so it's the north that we, we, uh, we don't have much budget, so we have at least some plan that it's not like random that we pick people. So we go to a place and then we feel the landscape and then so oh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, tree, orange trees around there. So, well, how about, you know, uh, go to this village which has a lot of of this tree and find someone, you know. So that's why I, I found these ladies and and uh, so and it's very interesting character also and it's part of my my, my motivation to to capture, you know, uh, the way she she told us the story and the way um, you know how the the belief how the experience of each person and religion belief and, and also geography contribute to to the story mm. so, so this is the you know it's the influence it's from the north you know but I, I'm not sure if it's <laughs> related to the geography or not mm. but, but it's more like just personality of this person yeah, and, and you can see the, the film travel from north to south and the dialect change um, you know from the north there's one dialect so in the east and they have another dialect and this is a northern dialect. So what you'll see first is a little bit of the story, a kind of fictionalization of the story about the teacher and the boy. Then you'll see a little bit of this woman adding to the story in a kind of very documentary mode. And then a little bit more of the fictional, fictionalization of the story. So let's just, we'll take a look at this clip and then we'll talk about, about it after that. Joe? As strange as this brief segment from this film might seem, the film actually gets much stranger as it goes along, and the story that's being told becomes stranger and stranger. This I couldn't believe I made it. Yeah. <laughs> like four, five, ten people, because 
I'm doing a camera and uh, doing the lighting and everything. And, and in Chicago, I wasn't really interested in, in this technical thing. I was more interested in, in theory and in, yeah, so, so when I was there, it was, because I also believe that shooting yourself is like part of practice and, and then, you know, you learn by, by doing it. Yeah, so, but if I have to do it again, I won't. <laughs> it's, it's a very hard time. Yeah. Back. This, this object that rolls out from under the teacher's skirt and becomes the second boy, it's never fully explained what that means or where that came from or where it all goes. It just The, the That's story kind of boy. keeps evolving and evolving and yeah, changing. Yeah, yeah. It's like the film itself. It just The film kind of is, is endless and expansive. It keeps building meaning on top of meaning and, and you can see more things in it and imagine more things growing out of it all the time. Yeah, it involved with this teacher and uh, boy and um, somehow the name in Thai Dok Pha is name Man mean uh, Dok Pha is the name of the teacher. Yeah, so she's kind of a main character also with the kid. Mm -hmm. Mysterious object also present this kid. Yeah, and at one point in, in the South that uh, the kids just told a story of, and then they had um, a bunch of school kids and they gathered in front of the microphone and, and they told a story and then suddenly Doc Fa was killed. I said, well, <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> the main character is dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then, uh, you know, so that's why we stopped the film there and then, you know, the, the kid killed the, the, the character. <laughs> but what another of the kids suggests that maybe she well, oh, turned into some kind of witch tiger or something as well. It's something that comes up in your later films too. Yes, but but not really. It, it stopped. But then the kid asks that if they can tell me another story, that they, they don't care anymore about my story. Mm. So so they start <laughs> to talk about the tiger that turned a man, a, a woman who turned into a tiger. And as the film goes on, you dramatize parts of the story in different ways. At one point, you have a kind of musical theater troupe act out a part of the story in a kind of uh, half acting, half sung performance of the story. Um, how many hours did you shoot? Uh, the film is eventually became 83 minutes long, but how many hours do you think you shot altogether? Uh, I think maybe one, two, 15 hours. 15 or? hours. Yeah, and there's a lot of elements that I, I, I I liked it, I put in, and actually you, I don't know if you're familiar with The Adventure of Iron Pussy, my, my film, and actually The Iron Pussy is in this film also. Yes, yeah. Remember? Yeah. 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 The, the bow guy who saved the girl and she, he's an Iron Pussy. This Adventures of Iron Pussy is, is another of Joe's film, which wasn't shown in this series, but was shown here in town as part of the Lesbian and Gay Film Festival, and it's a kind of celebration of the campy, trashy, overblown, older Thai cinema kind of hyperbolic vision of, of the charming aspects of old Thai cinema, but with a transvestite star. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. A beautiful transvestite star. <laughs> so, th I mean, this is a very unusual film and the kind of film you would see at, at maybe at film festivals around the world. It's a very kind of specialized film for a specialized audience. But Thailand has no history of experimental filmmaking, no no history of you know understanding strange mysterious objects like this film. What was the reaction to this film in Bangkok? Mm, we, we didn't show much. We we show in the um, in the short film festival organized by the Thai Film Foundation. So we shown it only mm, twice, and then last year there's a retrospective. Of, so we did show in Bangkok Film Festival. Yeah, that's all. And lots of the the people seen it on pirates, uh, VCD and DVD. Mm. So it never had a theatrical release at all in Thailand. No, no. Yeah. But you got a lot of acclaim internationally for making this film, and uh, people became familiar with your name a little bit and interested in what you might do next. Start with Rotterdam because the film was funded by the the grants from Rotterdam Film Festival. So it it supposed it had to be premiered there. So and, and it's a very good festival that you know all the uh, critics and uh, programmers went there and they saw the film. So even though when you originally when I asked you what's this film really about for you, you told me it's about nothing at all. 
but my feeling was, well, it's actually about everything, so many different things. But then you, your next feature film after this is a film that really almost is about, well, it appears to be about nothing at all. It's the film Blissfully Yours. And it's a film about the relationship between two women and one man who is a, a refugee from Burma who's come to Thailand in search of work. And it's a very beautiful and very sensual film, but there are long, long stretches in the film where almost nothing happens at all. We just observe these people uh, having a picnic in the forest or making love in the woods, getting away from the city and away from as many of the complications of their lives as possible. Um, maybe you can say something about what inspired you to make Blissfully Yours and, and what relationship it has to the historical relationship between Thailand and Burma. Well, uh, during the time when I made it or drafted the several films like Suryo Thai or Bangachan that dealt with the uh, Thai and Burma issues because we Bur Burma always has these minority groups that are always fighting and it affects our, you know, around border area because the uh, refugees are coming and um, also hostages, uh, you know, a situation um, that turns violent. So, uh, filmmakers tend to to make then to make film historical in a historical sense that that cast um, Burmese as um, um, how you call Konlai uh, villains their enemies or enemies uh, yeah so true. So, yeah yeah the so historical enemies of Thailand or the villains of the piece yeah, yeah. so I, I think it was very um, and and during that time Thailand has become very nationalistic you know. Um, the government, um, you know, encouraged people to put the flag on and to, and I was uh, quite upset with the situation, you know, and I, I think, you know, these films are bullshit, mm -hmm. so, so, so I tried to, to make my version of uh, my interpretation of, of, of um, the, the, the situation, but I don't want to focus on uh, stress on the political issue, so, I, I was more interested in um, how this daily life of, of people and I, I view this Burmese man as a spirit that, you know, f like floating in the jungle that um, there's two women try to hold on to. And I think you can look at it as um, from a political point of view also or from, you know, just aesthetic or from just, just feeling just feeling the, the the mood and and the oppressive kind of uh, environment, you know, that, that that suddenly you 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 think that this character is seeking space, seeking utopian space, but but it becomes something that they're in the the uh, some of them in the oppressive environment, or or one of them is not sure if they're happy or not. So it's just about human being. And, and how we suffer uh, from from our attachment, you know. So and so so this, but Burma, it becomes like a, a, a sub, how do you call it, subtext? A subtext to the yeah. yeah. It, it it doesn't matter for me if you know the the background of Thai Burma relationship or not. Yeah. So we're going to see a clip uh, that features the three central characters of the film: two women and one man. The man is from Burma. Uh, the younger woman is sort of his girlfriend, even though he has a wife who he's left behind in Burma, a wife and family. But the, there's also an older woman who, and there's a kind of tension between the two women, a rivalry for this guy. And they're both very solicitous and very eager to take care of this guy and touch him. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's blissfully yours. It's a, it's a film about taking refuge in sensuality and physical pleasure and and trying to get away from certain complications. Yeah, also about communication, also of how how we communicate, you know, and also the Burmese issue also because he he couldn't communicate, you know, directly or well in Thai. So many of the 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 details are from touching or you know or from looking. And, you know, it's more uh, uh, the story is in there in the movement. Yeah. So a mysterious object is so much about language, about telling stories, and this is more about feelings. Uh, 
you know, feeling our daily life. Yeah. It's also a very different film visually, I think, as you'll right. see in the clip. Right. It's much more about visual beauty. It's in color. It's much more about light and the way that yeah. the sun looks uh, on on nature and on water and on people's skin. Yeah, but I also think about that as a continuation of um, mysterious object at noon too, but but not not really, you know super continue but but more in a way of working style that I really like to work with non-professional and working with trying to get narrative uh, get story from their real life so it mix between fiction and non-fiction of how how these characters um, came to my life and then I changed the script according to their life and yeah so so many of the personality were from from the the real real actor that, that Let, let's take a look at the clip and then we can talk about it afterwards. So okay. Roll this clip. So it seems that in the course of the film, Min, who's come across the border into Thailand from Burma, has developed this kind of skin condition, something like a rash or some kind of horrible sunburn. Yes. So and it's a bit like the mysterious object. It's never made fully clear what this condition that he has is. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> no, it's just he's not. Mm, it's the way I don't know that one is very s kind of also in communication. Also, it's very sensitive to the touch, and also it very. It could be the sunburn. You know, it's because power of the nature, the sun, and also that how he also uncomfortable in in that skin of his. So the women are, they've made this special ointment, which is made up of vegetables and, yeah, and dried chilies and cold cream. And uh, yeah. <laughs> even though they take him to a doctor's office at the beginning of the film, which I take it is some way of getting over your relationship to your parents or something, um, uh, th they decide that traditional medicine is not really the answer. So they make this cold cream and vegetable concoction, yeah. which is, which on the older woman actually feeds a bite of to her husband at one point. Um, <laughs> and so they're applying this ointment to, to Min's skin here. Mm -hmm. This it, it sequence is, is interesting to me because of this tension between it's very sensual, it's very beautiful, it's very loving, but there's something very horrible about it too. I mean, he seems like some kind of burn victim. And that last close-up of his face, he seems like he could either be in ecstasy or in agony. Did you intend that kind of tension to be going on throughout the film, and especially in this scene? Um, I just feel more of ecstasy because uh, I like the way one feel uh, floating. You know, like I mentioned that he is spirit. You know, and so so this kind of thing, and also in in tropical malady, also I I, I feel the to to evoke the sense of my experience also, you know, of, of being float, um, like on drugs or something, hmm. I don't know, but, um, you know, the, the feeling that you, you, you kind of out of your body, and um, that, that's, that's kind of relate to about the identity also, about yourself, your, how you, how you define this self, and, I don't know, happiness, hard to explain. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a film that's hard to explain. It's, it's a film that just kind of unfolds in real time and, and meanders along at its own pace. Yeah, it's also all the structure of the films also that I made, it's, it's really like floating, floating, you just go anywhere and yeah. Also, your mind, your your eyes. Also, there's some long takes that just fit there, and you just just free to look wherever you want. You know, you don't at the cliff when they have a picnic. You you don't have to look at them. You know, you, then you look at the mountain behind, the trees behind, and so you free. It's open cinema. This film went uh, after Mysterious Object at Noon, which traveled to many film festivals. This film was invited to the Cannes Film Festival in 2002. Yes. Yes. And it won uh, 
a prize there, a kind of, it wasn't in the main competition at Cannes that year, but it, it did win a prize that year. Yes. Um, and this film actually opened in theaters in Bangkok briefly, is that right? Yes, yes. But it was also, well, one thing we should say about this film is that there are a number of explicit sex scenes in the film, um, particularly at the end of the film. And in fact, the first thing that I heard about this film when Joe was making it, everyone in Bangkok said to me, have you heard about Joe's new film? It's three hours long and it's a porno. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> yes, it's true. There's explicit sex in this film and that's something completely unusual for Thai films. But there's nothing, I mean, it's, it's, it's as far away from being a kind of porno film as it could possibly be. It's, it's sensual and, and unusual and it's, um, but of course, these explicit sex scenes made it very difficult, problematic for it to be shown in Bangkok at all. So it right, wasn't right. shown really in, in the version that you intended, is that right? Right, right. So I was, and also the, I think DVD, VCD release, they cut a lot of the sex scene. So I was not very pleased. Yeah, so that's, that's how I also got interested into how the system worked, their censorship. Mm -hmm. and then now we lobby to, to change the law that it's been uh, practice for 70 years in Thailand and this uh, archaic, you know, um, system because the censorship is is under the Ministry of um, Kalahom, Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ministry of Defense, which is nothing related to. Mm -hmm. So we try to push to a Ministry of Culture, which is just recently, you know, have been found. You know, we we never have the culture. Uh, department in, in our government before, so just less than 10 years. So uh, we try to push that and have these um, people go out, you know. So I become quite more, more aggressive in trying to, to change the system, yeah, and create some enemies along the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. It puts you in an unusual position because on the one hand your films are almost in a way, or have been until recently, almost unknown inside of Thailand, and in fact, in some ways, can't be shown for legal reasons. But on the other hand, internationally, you're the most famous Thai filmmaker in the world at the moment. <laughs> well, in some ways. I mean, you're one of the two or three, maybe. But you're winning these, you know, very important international prizes at international film festivals. And, and so your films get reported on in the newspapers in Thailand, but, but, yeah. but your films until recently weren't even shown there or couldn't be shown in their in yeah. the version you intended them to be shown. I remember I attended a seminar and about censorship law and it's all about these um, government bodies and, and the filmmaker, <laughs> one filmmaker there. And suddenly they showed a clip from Blissfully Yours, that clip, and, and I didn't know if they, they knew that I was there and they said, oh, this, they, they showed an example of immoral thing that's going on in, 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 in Thai cinema. <laughs> Yes, and so you're, you're the example of immoral, yeah, I was immorality. Sitting there, mm, this is interesting, <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, it, it just showed that you know that that the quite that we need a rating system. We we never had rating system, so anyone can can go there in the cinema. And what uh, I think is uh, uh, problematic is that they they very strict on uh, nudity, but but for violence um, is very open. Mm. Yeah, even in television, you know, you can see people, you know, shooting and other people with blood and, yeah, and, but they ban nudity, mm. you know, and also smoking cigarette yes. in, 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 in TV. Uh, when one smoke, you got this blur or mosaic <laughs> thing, you know, and... It's very funny on Thai television, you will see entire scenes where there's almost, you can't, you can't even see anything. Right. You, you can see the blur of someone bringing the cigarette up to their mouth, and then the whole screen goes fuzzy. Yeah, but but now but now you 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 can see you cannot see the gun also the gun also blur, mm -hmm. but but if it's a long shot it's okay if if it's and if it's not inflicting one another person it's okay, you know like this not not okay. And but if you have long shot and shooting and you have this <laughs> blood it's okay. Mm. So I don't know this kind of <laughs> who decide. The law and and in blissful yours, the thing that was most objectionable, I guess, is the shot of men's penis yeah. in, in, the, in the, at the end of the film. So you can't see a cigarette, you can't see a gun, and you can't see a penis. There's, I think, there's some kind yeah. of continuity here. Yeah, 
I, I have nothing against violence, but but um, at least they should have, you know, a rating or, or some mm -hmm. kind of system. There are many, many more issues that we could talk about, about about each of these clips and about all of your films, but in the interest of just kind of moving on and the time we have here, um, after uh, after Blissful Yours, then you became involved with uh, financing and producers from all around Europe, particularly, and, and French co-producers um, who were involved in the making of your most recent film, Tropical Malady, which again was invited to Cannes, this time in competition. The first Thai film, I think, ever that was in the main competition at the Cannes Film Festival. And indeed, you won a prize there. You won the special jury prize for Tropical Malady this year. Um, I'm not sure that Tropical Malady is a cross between Mysterious Object and Blissfully Yours, but there's more going on in Tropical Malady than in Blissfully Yours, at least on the surface. More different sorts of things, a combination of different sorts of things. Uh, a love story, a kind of horror film, bits of old fables and uh, folk stories. It begins as a kind of romance between a soldier and a country boy and ends up as a kind of dialogue between the soldier and a talking monkey and a, uh, the spirit of a tiger who may be his lover and may not be. And it's more of I think it's continuation of blissfully yours about you know this attachment of when one has but this one is more personal in a way that I after blissfully yours um, I, I drafted tropical melody uh, before blissfully yours finished so uh, I think of how, how do I express myself and what I experience and in but still continue the same concept of of suffering of when one attached to to another person so uh, but but at the time my relationship was bad so so <laughs> so tropical melody becomes my i think darkest film um you know compared to other video works and stuff so it was um and it was very sad also making it you know because many of the many of the scenes are cue from my experience and Many of the setting of the locations, um, you know, like like blissfully you are that I attach to certain. I, I I really like to go to that cliff. I like to go to that thing. So I put in my film and tropical melody. Also, it is the place that I used to be. Also, used to go with the crew of blissfully yours. And there's an old lady who who just helping us during the shoot of and providing us with you know <laughs> with this uh, what you know, cigarette, uh, that how you call that, grass, and then, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, so I, I combined this element of, of happiness and sadness together, but at, 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 the big, at the first part of the film, it's, even though it's presented as utopian or happiness, but, but for me, you know, I have different takes than other audience because it's my life, you know, but it's not totally, you know, I don't have that super cute boyfriend, mm -hmm. but but it was very, uh, I'll say, emotional working on the film, you know, to go on the place and then try to have the actor uh, reenact um, uh, some of the things that actually happened or some of the things that in my imagine, imagine, imagination uh, for, for a long time. Yeah, so, um, so it, and then it combines with many, um, kind of uh, culture and landscape of a small town, you know, because um, people ask me, uh, why do I always make a film about small town? Because um, I think small town is, uh, in Thailand, is, is, like I said, it's changing very fast. And I try to capture that um, um, before it change, you know, um, that, that it has to be in, in, in my memory. It's like diary. You know, there are many scenes that you know, all reference that from mysterious objects from this reviewers that that happen again in in this film it's because I feel it's like continuation of diary of uh, of my life and of the place. You know, so I, I think Bangkok is also changing fast, but but I think it it can wait. So, <laughs> but small town cannot. Hmm. So so that's why I choose small town also. And yeah. So if Blissful Yours is kind of about 
these two historical enemies, Thailand and Burma, uh, coming together in a way and finding as the secret place where they can come together at last and be find some bliss. Uh, Tropical Malady is about coming together and then being torn apart again. And the film is split into two parts. It's a kind of distinct halfway point in Tropical Malady where the film changes from being a very happy kind of love story where everyone is smiling at each other all the time to becoming something much stranger and much darker. Mm -hmm. The the clip that we've chosen here is that transitional moment between the two halves of the films, uh, of the film, of Tropical Malady. So we'll look at that and we'll talk about that for a minute and then we'll open uh, this dialogue up to the audience and perhaps some of you have questions for Joe and we can we can conclude there. But let's take a look at the... You know, we get back to the idea again of migration that's going on in, in Mysterious Object and people moving from one place to another, or going from day to night, from a relationship to a breakup, to a, from a kind of straight ahead narrative to something much, much stranger. I noticed that in many of your films there are long sequences where people are just driving and driving. What, what, what appeals to you about that sort of migration? Mm. It's because when, I think when you drive, um, it becomes, like I said, it's, it's about parallel world and out, out, out of body experience for me because when you look at the view, you, you, you have another narrative going on. It's like when you sit, because you're doing nothing, you know. It's, it's become, you have other narrative, you know, it's become two in one. And so, so for me, it, it, it's like, um, you know, going from one place to another in time physically and also in men- mentally also, you know, that you have this, um, I don't know if I <laughs> explain it right, and yeah, but is kind of is it related to this idea of floating and yeah, yeah. being able to kind of both be in yourself and look outside yourself and associate randomly associate and draw yes stories yes. from from the air from things that are passing by from other people uh-huh. from people's faces even uh, because when when driving there's no narrative going on so it just just a street so you put in the put the audience to the situation that become like driving, mm. become like sitting in a car and your mind f- floats somewhere. And so, and also the, the whole film is about tripping also, the second part, you know, it's the first part was uh, in the jungle even like during the day you experience things visually, you know, but for, and, and for when it's dark, it becomes, you don't see not anything, so your minds take over, you know, so it's become like a mind trip. Mm. Well, I think there are, there are just so many ideas and, and topics and types of visual experience and sonic experience that, that we could talk about about your films. There's so many ideas and, and, and things going on. But maybe we should open uh, this dialogue up to the audience and let see if people have questions for you about your films. Yes, yes. Um, one thing that's n- that maybe we don't get a sense of here is that Joe has a very strong relationship, even though his films are strange and experimental and unusual in many ways and completely different from most of the Renaissance and Thai filmmaking that's going on today, which is mainly about popular films and blockbuster films, romances, comedies, action films, that Joe has a very strong relationship to pop culture too. There are lots of ideas about soap operas and comic books and popular music that take place throughout your films that maybe take place on a kind of subconscious or subtextual level. In uh, a lot in a lot in my short films and videos and installation that very few people know they exist. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but I keep kept doing it, kept doing it them. Yeah. Are there questions from the audience for Joe? If not, we, Joe and I can keep talking up here, but uh, maybe people have questions about the films that you've seen or clips, questions about the clips we've seen tonight or some of these very strange and beautiful ideas that Joe is trying to work with in, in his films. Please. Uh, well, it seems like in the U.S. there's a lot of focus on how films get made, how, how they're paid for, or the money, you know, how they cost millions of dollars. And I'm just wondering, is that a big issue for you raising funds? Put these films together, and if so, where do you raise 
Um, well, from the beginning, yes, I, I, I was like everyone desperate and then sent a lot of emails to to get fund and um, you know, and so the first film was funded by festival and um, and by um, companies in Thailand, yeah. And um, the second one was funded by a Taiwanese businessman and a French, you know, uh, guy that produced also tropical malady. Um, but but um, like in here, there are uh, quite a people who love art, and also there's another channel that people so rich that that their channel is kind of one way to to how you call it? Yeah, yo you kind of transfer money through film and they don't have to pay tax and or, or something like offshore kind of thing you know they're so rich they don't care and they don't even know <laughs> what film they're doing but but I'm now I'm tapping into that that kind of thing but <laughs> for the next film yeah but from the past is is more of a passion of the people who 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 likes art and and yeah because I I'm a member of a uh, uh, one gallery called Project 304 that we formed together uh, to present contemporary art. Yeah, but yeah. So um, and for Tropical Melody was uh, quite a big budget compared to other Thai films. And luckily, I have a good producer, the French one. Yeah. About how much did Tropical Melody cost to make? About one million U.S. A typical Thai film today costs about half a million dollars U.S. A typical mainstream film, yeah. whereas a typical low-budget U.S. film today would cost five or six million. Mm -hmm. Typically, Thai films, popular Thai films, are made for about five hundred thousand or seven hundred and fifty thousand U.S. bucks. Yeah. So this producer of mine, you know, I remember when when we did it, we had the rough cut, and then that is. Producer, and uh, it's a Italian producer taking the um, TV guy came to look at the film, you know, and my producer tried to, hey, don't come to Thailand, it's it's not finished. So it's very dangerous to have someone see the rough and, you know, with not finished. So and after the guy saw the film and was he was completely his his face turned white, and was, oh, and he started to insult me that. Well, what did you do and something like that and and I was so embarrassed and and anyway we went back and then they tried he tried to force the change you know and so my producer came to him and and said well if you say one more word I'm gonna throw you down this balcony right now <laughs> and and he really meant it he really meant it because he's a very big guy yeah so so that guy <laughs> shut up and 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 afterwards, when the film went to Cannes, and you know, this guy show up and very happy. You know? <laughs> so I think it's just the way that you know, producer defend you, and you know, artistic point of view. And then I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, that I, I got to know this group of people. It was called Anna Sanders Films, and they're a bunch of artists, about five people who gather together to support. Art and we collaborate sometimes. They're based in France. They're based in France, and um, there's something about French people <laughs> that, <laughs> that, yeah, a new project of mine also in 2006. Or, and there's this company in LA contact me. I said, mm, "This is interesting. American people interested in my work." So I went there, and then you know, it turned out to be three French guy <laughs> <laughs> living in LA. <laughs> I think yeah. these French guys have a good idea. Enjoy my art film or I'll break your legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that for me I don't I don't I don't really look at it as, as you know, art in that difficult, you know, it's it's entertainment, you know, in a different form, in a different way. Yeah. I guess we should say also that Tropical Malady did play in theaters in Bangkok and actually did very well. Surprisingly, yeah. Surprisingly well. well yeah. It played for five or six weeks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Thai film critics and Thai audiences were very responsive to the film for the first time. Yes. Um, but it just played in one theater in Bangkok, is that right? Yes, it's like um, um, three theaters and then it reduced to one theater in downtown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like an uh, art house uh, become. 
we have some other questions from anyone? Please. Um, like what? Well, Spider-Man. Yeah, and Hollywood what films what? are still the bulk of what Thai audiences go to see. Um, there are many, many multiplexes, just like in the States, in Bangkok. Um, and, yeah, I would say 70% of the films playing in Thailand at any given time are Hollywood films. Then Hong Kong action films. Korean. Korean maybe. romantic comedies. And, and Thai films. Yeah. We should, we should also say that as recently as, say, 1990, Thai film production, all Thai films, there were about five or six new feature films, Thai feature films being made in Thailand every year. This year, there are something like 60 Thai films being released in Thai theaters, so a tenfold increase uh, over the last decade. Um, and there are probably, I don't know, between 50 and 100 films in production right now in Thailand at any given time, Thai films. So, and, and Thai films occasionally these days even make more money than, than Hollywood films in Thailand. Yeah. Um, so Thai films are, but, but the, the majority of Thai films that are being made today are like action films, comedies, uh, horror movies. Uh, or drama, that, that like this overture. Yeah, thing that is quite a very solid narrative story, but but um, I was upset about the style because the guy doesn't have a style. Yeah. He just um, because you know it, it's more like a copy from Hollywood style. You know the story is very beautiful, but but um, it is it's like a language that you don't have originality. You know because I believe you know he has a very good story but if you told in a different way people still can enjoy and become emotional also but since um, many filmmakers are trapped in this uh, storytelling way of you know um, McDonald's style so it becomes very um, um, sad because you know thinking about the rich culture and the rich storytelling in the past we have with old Thai films so um, I think you know but but anyway, I, I have nothing against, you know, Hollywood film or, or Thai film this way, but I wish that we had more variety, you know, because we had so many attention from, from the outside, from the festival and from people, you know, that, you know, came to look for film uh, f uh, for their festival. But um, it's quite a, um, somehow I thought that we, we didn't deserve this attention you know it's more like a fad of you know um, film programmers trying to find something new you mm. know? Thailand hasn't just been hasn't been covered so they just okay Thailand Thailand is today's hot yeah. cinema yes but but so I, I, I really think that um, you know um, the government should come more forward and support new voices and a new style of film and you know so we have varieties, you know, Hollywood style, you know, experimental style, and many styles. So, like Korean, it's very healthy. So just to finish answering your question, no one else is really making films or feature films like Joe's films at all in Thailand. They're really very unique there. Um, yeah, they're they're a world apart from 99% of what's going on in Thai cinema. Thailand is more like a studio system. So um, uh, from the past, I've been to all the studios, and um, of course, I, I wouldn't, you know, compromise. So, um, but there's this new young kind of studio that sprout up, and and parts of them are, are kind of branch of the the super big studio. There's one place called Grammy. And they are like a conglomerate, no, I don't know, not conglomerate, it's like an empire of media. 
radio and so on. So they have this division of small film just recently launched, and they co-produce Tropical Malady. And they totally, um, the whole funding of the adventure of Han Pussy. And for the next film also, uh, I will work with them. So, and also another company called Five Stars, that they just changed the system of funding that um, young generation, the daughter of the, uh, the owner just took over the company. So this is, I think, two of the most interesting source of for independent and new kind of cinema. But, but still, I think um, we, we also have to look outside also for co-production. Yeah, because I think film is about uh, sharing cultures and about, you know, um, of course, it's about business also, but, but it, it works both ways. You know, when you have international co-production, you have pre-sales to TV in many countries, and you, know, you, have, you can realize your dream. And, and when you ha think about other audience in many countries, it it more diverse than just thinking about Thailand and so some people say I, I didn't make film for Thai people which is um, wrong because I I make film for myself you know it just I think that there are many people like me you know I don't care if it in Thailand or in other places that can connect with my film and um, but of course my film is very uh, I think. Um, Thai people will look at it different way, you know, because there are some nuance that you cannot s translate, and it's, it's quite popular with students and young people that um, they're very inspired by the films that I made. Um, even though some of them really like to make this kind of film, or some some really don't like the film, but at least they got the, the inspiration to hey, I can do better, you know. So so it's more like a a film is like a, a mysterious object in, in the country to, to stimulate people to, to be more active, you know, yeah. So, we'll, we'll let him go first and we'll come back to you. Could you talk a little bit about your actors? Yes, yes. The uh, most of them not professionals. Um, some of them, I uh, they're extras in a way that they usually like walking behind, <laughs> you know, just walking extras. And so uh, they are very um, inexperienced. So we had a long workshop, you know, um, and then we always train the video camera on them all the time to get them a sense of to to get the presence of camera and lose themselves not not being conscious about being filmed and I try to observe that gesture and try to talk to them and get get to know them and and to know their life history and you know so um, yeah like that so I met people on the street yeah and from the girl from Bristol US I I met her in a bar she work. She works at, as a waitress in the bar, and um, from a young guy from Tropical Malady, I met him in a, a discotheque. Yes. So, good place to scout. <laughs> you're mellow out here. Are you pretty mellow when you're shooting, also, or is it the surface that one cares about a lot? Jayen. Um, I have an assistant producer, uh, an assistant director who is very um, aggressive. <laughs> 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 yeah, and uh, she she is, if if she's here, you know, she she's very mellow. She's super mellow. She she talk very low, very low. But when she works, wow, well, it's like <laughs> she she's the one who got this, uh, you know, telecom mm, speaker. And horn. Yeah, and then she shout. <laughs> yeah, but but normally she's very quiet. Yeah. And That's pretty typical, though, on film shoots. The assistant director is the one who cracks the whip. Yeah, and the thing is, I really enjoy working with with women. Yeah, because I I found that this is not a sexy story. It's no, no it's, I just found that women are very sensitive, and and all when when I an interview people and they're in tune with the story and they give a lot of um, ideas and a lot of suggestion, you know, and 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 I don't know about here, but 
in Thailand, I think women are more tough than men. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So. <laughs> I think it's good too because historically there have been so few women involved in film production. In fact, I think I can only think of one woman, a female film director, in yeah. the history of Thai cinema. Yeah. So the more opportunities, the better. I think. Mong Khun also. Yeah, but she's a producer. Oh, that's true. She has. Okay, so two two female directors. Yeah, yeah. I think we're coming to the end of our officially allotted time for tonight's dialogue, um, but I think we could hang out for a few more minutes. If anyone has any questions informally, you could come up and talk to Joe for a couple of minutes. But I guess we'd just like to say thanks very much to everyone for coming, for watching the films, and coming tonight to uh, to listen to what Joe has to say about his work. And thanks, Joe, for coming Thank here you. and being with us. Oh. Thank you, everyone, for oh. coming. Thank you very much.